Chapter 13 Taking a Stand for Your Family One of the greatest threats we face in the 21st century is not a terrorist attack or an ecological catastrophe, but an attack on our homes. The enemy would love nothing more than to ruin your relationship with your husband or wife, your parents or your children. Too many homes are being destroyed through strife, or lack of commitment, wrong priorities, or bad attitudes. If we're going to have strong, healthy relationships, we must dig our heels in and fight for our families. The Old Testament records a time when Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. The walls had been torn down years previously, and the enemy was coming against God's people, against their homes, their wives and children, while the men worked on the construction crews. The situation got so bad that Nehemiah instructed his men to work with a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other. He encouraged them, Men, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, fight for your families. He went on to say, If you will fight, then God will fight. I believe God is saying something similar to us today. If we will do our part and take a strong stand for our families, God will do His part. He'll help us to have great marriages and great relationships with our parents and children. And certainly not everyone will get married, but if a man or woman choose to marry, two issues must be settled first. Number one, as a couple, we are committed to God. We're going to live a life that honors Him. We will be people of excellence and integrity in all that we do. The second settled issue must be that as a couple, we are going to be committed to each other. Occasionally, we may disagree, say some things that we shouldn't, but when it's all said and done, we're going to get over it, and we will forgive and move on. Leaving is not an option. We are committed to each other through the good times and the tough times. If bailing out of the relationship is an option, then you will always find some reason to justify it. Joel, we just can't get along. We're not compatible. We tried. We just don't love each other anymore. The truth is, no two people are completely compatible. We have to learn to become one. That means we may have to make sacrifices. We may have to overlook some things. We must be willing to compromise for the good of the relationship. Stick with your spouse and make that relationship work. As one lady said, My husband and I got married for better or for worse. He couldn't do any better, and I couldn't do any worse. When you do have disagreements, learn to disagree from the neck up. Don't let it get down in your heart. Victoria and I don't always see eye to eye but we've learned how to agree to disagree. When you present your case, don't try to make that other person change his or her mind. Give others the right to have their own opinion. If you're not going to be happy unless they agree with you, you're just trying to manipulate your partner. You're trying to force your opinion on that person. And the better approach is to present your case, share your heart, and then step back and allow God to work in that person or that situation. As long as we're argumentative and we're trying to force our opinions, then there's going to be strife in our homes. Wherever there's strife, there's confusion. There's nothing worse than living in a home that's tense. Everybody's on edge. You feel that at any moment something could explode. You don't have to live that way. Do your best to create an atmosphere of peace and unity in your home. When you're tempted to pop off and say hurtful, critical things, the next time you have that opportunity, do yourself a favor. Take a deep breath, pause about 10 seconds, and think about what you're going to say before you speak it. Words can cut like a knife. You may say them in a matter of seconds, but three months later, the person that you said it to is still feeling the sting. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. His book of wisdom encourages a husband to look his wife in the eyes and tell her, there are many beautiful women in the world, but you excel them all. Solomon started his day off 
by praising and encouraging his wife. Men, you can imagine how our relationships would improve if we'd start complimenting our wives like that. Some women haven't had a compliment in years, not because they don't deserve it, but because they are not appreciated. All they hear is what they're doing wrong, how their dinner wasn't good and the kids are too loud. Listen carefully to the words and tone of voice you use with your spouse. Are you complaining all the time, telling her what she's not doing right? Or are you doing like Solomon, blessing, encouraging, and uplifting that woman? Well, you say, you don't know my wife. She's the problem. She's argumentative. She's hard to get along with. Maybe so. But if you'll start praising your wife, if you'll start telling her how beautiful she is and how glad you are to have her in your life, when you talk about the good, you will draw out the good. If you talk about the negative, you're going to draw out the negative. It's up to you. Men, learn to speak blessings over your wife, and you will see that woman rise to a new level. She will respond to your praise and encouragement. Your words don't have to be fancy or profound. Just simply tell her, you're a great mother to our children. You're a great wife to me. I'm so glad I can always count on you. Understand, this is not an option. It's a necessity if you're going to have a healthy marriage. Like Solomon, get in the habit of looking at your wife and saying, You are beautiful. There are a lot of pretty women, but you excel them all. And if you're a father, you need to make especially sure that you affirm your children. You have incredible influence over them. And every day, just as you bless your wife, bless your children as well. Look at each child and say, I'm so proud of you. I think you're great. There's nothing that you can't do. Your children need your approval. You're helping them to form their identity. If we're too busy as fathers, we're never there, or maybe we're always just correcting our children without providing them the affirmation, then our children are not going to be as confident and secure as they should be. And certainly there are times when the father can't be there for the children because of other responsibilities, but do your best to keep your priorities in order because no amount of success in your career can make up for failure at home. I've seen some men accomplish great things in the corporate world, but they did it at the expense of their children. Their children grew up without a father figure. Fathers, take your children to church. Don't send them. Be at their ball games as often as possible. Know who their friends are. Listen to their music. Children are looking for direction and guidance. When that young man comes over to take your daughter out on a date, be the first one at the door. Let him know there's a man in the house watching over that young lady. Parents, we have to fight for our children. If we will fight for them, God will fight with us. Years ago, at the largest game reserve in South Africa, they developed an overpopulation of elephants. The staff decided to take 300 of the youngest male elephants and separate them from their parents and other adult elephants. These young male elephants were transported to another national park where the white rhinoceros reigned as the dominant king of the park. The rhinoceros has no natural enemies. Nothing stalks it, not even a lion, a tiger, a bear. The rhino is simply too powerful. The staff felt there would be no problem mixing the orphan elephants in with the rhinos. Over time, however, they began to find dead rhinos out in the brush. They couldn't understand what was happening, so they set up surveillance cameras to observe the park. Much to their surprise, they found that those young male elephants, the ones that no longer had a father or mother figure, had formed gangs and they had viciously attacked the rhino population. It's not even in the elephant's God-given natural instincts to act this way, but the lack of parental influence caused this strange, deadly behavior. I believe the same thing threatens our children. The reason that children get into trouble can often be traced back to the fact 
that they do not have positive role models in their lives. They don't have anyone speaking blessings over them and praying for them. They don't have father figures, and many don't have healthy, positive mother figures. And it doesn't mean the children are hopeless. It's simply a fact that without parental guidance, children sometimes do things that they might not otherwise do if mom or dad were around. We have a responsibility to reach out to children who don't have a father figure or a mother figure. Maybe you can mentor a young man or young woman. If you really want to be blessed, don't just fight for your family. Fight for somebody else's family. Stand in the gap for that single mom or single dad. When you take your son out to hit baseballs, swing by and pick up that young man who doesn't have a father figure. Reach out to some other children. As you take time for others, God will always provide for you. Chapter 14 Invest in Your Relationships If you want your relationships to thrive, you must invest in them by being a giver rather than a taker. Everywhere you go, strive to make relational deposits into people's lives, encouraging them, building them up, and helping them to feel better about themselves. And it's not always easy. Some people are difficult to be around because they tend to draw the life and the energy out of you. They're not bad people. They just drain you. They always have a problem or some kind of major crisis. They talk all the time, so much so you can't get a word in edgewise. And by the time the conversation is done, you feel as though your emotional energy is drained. Difficult people don't make positive deposits. They're too busy making withdrawals. And please don't misunderstand me. It's okay to be down and discouraged occasionally. Everybody has a right to have a bad day. But if you do that all the time, that's a problem. You're not going to have good friendships if you're always draining the emotional reserves of the people around you. I like to think of my relationships as an emotional bank account. I have an account with every person with whom I have a relationship, whether a family member, a business associate, friends, even some people I meet in passing. I have an emotional account with the security guard at work, the man at the gas station, the waiter at the restaurant. Every time I interact with them, I'm either making a deposit or I'm making a withdrawal from that account. How do you make deposits? It can be something as simple as taking the time to walk over and shake a man's hand. How are you doing today? Good morning. Good to see you. Just the simple fact that you went out of your way to make him feel important made a deposit into his account. Your act of kindness built trust and respect. You can make a deposit simply by smiling at somebody, being friendly, being pleasant to them in just ordinary circumstances. When you compliment people, you're making a deposit. Tell that coworker that was an outstanding presentation. You did a great job. Tell your husband, I appreciate what you do for this family. Or maybe your wife, you make it so much fun to live around here. When you do these things, you're not merely giving a compliment. You're making a deposit into the account that you share with that person. At home, you can make deposits in your emotional accounts by giving your wife a hug and a kiss, telling her that you love her. You make deposits into your accounts with your children by spending time with them, by listening to your daughter when she's playing the piano, by going down to the park and watching your son skateboard. A subtle yet amazingly effective means of making deposits is by overlooking a fault. Maybe a co-worker is rude. He jumps down your throat about some meaningless matter. But instead of retaliating, you let it go. The next day when he apologizes, you say, hey, don't even worry about it. I've already forgiven you. I didn't think twice about it. I knew that wasn't your normal self. When you do such things, you make huge deposits into your account with that person. Your stock goes up significantly on his scale. Perhaps one day, you're a bit stressed out and on edge, and maybe you don't treat him as well as you should. You'll have plenty in your account to cover it. 
How do we make withdrawals from our relationship accounts? The most common way of making a withdrawal is through selfish behavior. When we're only thinking about what we want and what we need, we inevitably withdraw resources from our relationship accounts. We make withdrawals when we don't take time for people. You go into the office and just blow past the receptionist. You don't smile or even notice her. Whether your mind was somewhere else or you were just having a hard day, you just made a withdrawal from your account with that person. You lowered her opinion of you. Other ways we make withdrawals include those incidents in which we don't forgive, when we don't keep our commitments, when we don't express appreciation to someone that deserves it. Maybe somebody does something nice for you by going out of their way, but you take it for granted. You don't say thank you, or maybe you feel like you're too important to say something such as, I appreciate your effort. Failure to appreciate the kindnesses of others will always result in a withdrawal from your account with those people. The problem in many of our relationships is that our accounts are overdrawn. When we make a mistake and we need a little mercy or a little understanding, that person goes to our relationship account and discovers it's already empty. Now we must live constantly on edge. Minor issues become magnified. We have to guard every little word we say because there's no reservoir of grace from which to draw in that relationship. We've exhausted the resources, and that's when little things suddenly turn into big things. For instance, you correct your teenage son, and seemingly out of the blue, he blows up. Who are you to tell me that? I don't have to listen to you. Those statements are revealing that your relationship account with him is depleted. He's saying, in effect, you haven't built trust with me. You haven't taken an interest in me. You haven't let me know that I'm important to you. If you're going to correct someone, or maybe you're going to offer some constructive criticism, you need to make sure that you've made plenty of deposits into your account with that person. Make sure you've earned that person's respect. In disciplining your children, ask yourself, have I encouraged him? Have I complimented her? Have I been interested in what he's interested in? Or have I simply been making withdrawals? If all your child has heard for the last couple of months is clean your room, do your homework, take out the trash, tuck your shirt in, you are merely making withdrawals. And the truth is, parents must make many withdrawals during their children's teenage years but you cannot expect to speak effectively into your child's life unless you first made plenty of deposits. You must invest in that relationship, nurture it, and build trust. And everywhere we go, we should be making deposits, whether at the grocery store, the ballpark, the school, or the office. Develop a habit of sowing good things into people's lives. Make it your business to help someone else feel better about himself or herself. Be interested in people. Take time to let someone know that you care. Go out of your way to show somebody that they're special. When you leave the office, instead of rushing out of the parking garage, take a few moments and ask the attendant, how are you doing today? I'm so glad you're a part of this company. Encourage him in some way. Make him feel that he's important. Help him to know that somebody cares. Learn to appreciate people. Learn to say thank you. And just because someone works for you doesn't mean that you're exempt from expressing appreciation to that person. Well, Joel, I pay him good money. Or I pay high enough taxes. I shouldn't have to thank that policeman. I shouldn't have to thank that school teacher. They should just do their jobs. No, learn to sow positive deposits into people's lives everywhere you go. I remember when I was at my father's house, he would see the mailman coming. Daddy would get a big smile on his face, and he'd say, well, looky here, here comes the finest mailman in all the world. That mailman's countenance would lighten up. My father's simple compliment brightened that man's day. It didn't take a lot of effort, didn't require much of his time. He had developed a habit of investing in people and helping others to feel better about themselves. Your words have the power to put a spring in somebody's step. 
to lift them out of defeat and discouragement, to help propel them to victory. A simple deposit, just like my father made, didn't take more than 10 or 15 seconds. Learn to give compliments freely. Learn to be friendly and avoid anything that exudes the attitude that you're so important that you can't take time for somebody who's not up to your level. Instead, make everyone you meet feel important. Strive to make every person who you have contact with feel special. After all, every person you meet is made in the image of Almighty God. Chapter 15 Being Good to People Do you want to get more out of life? Here's a suggestion. Get up every day and rather than trying to be blessed, do everything you can to be a blessing to someone else. If you will do that for six weeks, trying to be a blessing to someone every day, I believe your life will be filled with so many blessings you won't be able to contain them all. I've discovered if I meet other people's needs, God will always meet my own needs. If I make somebody else happy, God will make sure that I'm happy. Every day, we should look for opportunities to be good to people. Maybe you can buy somebody's lunch, give someone a ride, babysit someone's children. Get in a habit of doing something good for someone every day. Don't make the mistake of living selfishly. That's one of the worst prisons you could ever live in. You were not created to be focused only on yourself. God made you to be a giver. The best way for you to be fulfilled is to get your mind off yourself and reach out to others. Learn to be good to people in your everyday life. When you go to the lunchroom, bring your co-worker a cup of coffee back. You may be thinking, I'm not going to do that. He never does anything for me. But be bigger than that. Do it unto God. Don't miss an opportunity to do something good for someone. On the freeway, when traffic backs up, let that car squeeze in in front of you. At the grocery store, when you have a large basket full of groceries, the person behind you is carrying just a few, let them go ahead of you. In the parking lot, when you pull up to that last spot at the same time as another car, back up and let the other person have that space. Prefer them over you. Be good to somebody. Victoria and I went to a restaurant where we'd eaten a number of times before, and we practically knew the menu by heart. We knew exactly what we wanted. And we sat down, we ordered right away, and I was hungry, but it seemed to take forever for the cooks to prepare our food. We waited and waited, and it didn't make sense. The restaurant wasn't even busy. When the waitress finally brought the food, our order was not right. She returned my food to the kitchen. It was another long delay. Finally, I got tired of waiting and began eating off Victoria's plate. It was the worst service we had probably ever had in a restaurant. When it came time to pay the bill and leave the tip, I thought, God, now you just saw what happened. Now, I know you're a just God, and surely you don't expect me to leave a good tip. Almost immediately, I knew I was wrong. I said, okay, God, how about 5%? Let me tell you a secret. Don't ever negotiate with God because you'll never win. I said, okay, God, how about 10%, 15%? That's the normal amount. God, you know that's the going rate. I should be able to do that. But I still didn't have any peace. I knew God was saying, don't miss this opportunity to do good. Don't miss this opportunity to show mercy. We can be good to people when they're good to us. That's easy. But God wants us to be good to people even when they're not so good to us. I eventually changed my attitude and thought, I'm not just going to give this girl a tip. I'm going to sow a seed into her life. I'm going to go the extra mile and be good to her. We left a $20 tip for a $30 meal, but we did it as sowing a seed. A few weeks later, I received a letter from that young lady. I had no idea that she had recognized Victoria and I. She didn't give us any indication that she knew us. Her letter began by asking, Do you remember me? I'm the girl who waited on you at what was probably your worst restaurant experience ever. I thought to myself, I know exactly who you are. 
She went on to tell how she had been raised in a good Christian family. They went to church every Sunday, but in her late teens, her family was hurt by a leader in their congregation. Somebody did them wrong. The entire family now had given up on God, dropped out of church. Over the last year or two, they had been watching me on television. The waitress related in her letter, I told my parents, I know these people are real. Something on the inside tells me they're sincere and we need to get back in church. She continued, Joel, when you and your wife came in the restaurant and we got your order all mixed up, most people would have gotten aggravated and upset, but you two were so nice and kind. And on top of that, you left us that big tip. She said that confirmed what I already knew in my heart. I went home and told my parents what happened, and now we've gotten our lives back on track, and we're at Lakewood every Sunday morning. Learn to be good to people. That's one of the best witnesses we can ever have. Now when I tip people, I tell Victoria, we're going to sow a seed into their life. Here's an opportunity to do good. When I leave that place, I want them to be able to say, that couple sure is generous. They sure are good to people. See, the world does not need to hear another sermon nearly as much as it needs to see one. Learn to give your time, your money, an encouraging word. Meet a need. When you show love, you are showing God to the world. Don't worry about it if you don't get any credit. If that young lady hadn't written to Victoria and me, it wouldn't have mattered one bit. I would still feel that we did the right thing. When you let somebody in traffic in front of you, you may never see that person. When you give somebody $20 simply because you felt compassion in your heart, you may never hear back from them. But that's okay. God's keeping the records. He sees every act of kindness you show. He sees every time you're good to somebody. He hears every encouraging word you speak. God has seen all the times you went out of your way to help somebody that never said thank you. Your good deeds do not go unnoticed by Almighty God. When you study the life of Jesus, you'll notice that He always took time for people. He was busy, He had places to go, but He was always willing to change His plans in order to do good for somebody else. As He walked through the villages, people called out to Him, Jesus, please come over here and pray for us. He would stop and go out of his way to bring healing to those people. One time they came up to him and said, Jesus, please come to our city. Our relative is so sick. You've got to pray for him. Jesus changed his plans and went that way. When they tried to bring the little children to Jesus, the disciples said, no, don't bother him. He's busy. He's too important. Jesus said, no, no, let the children come to me. It's easy for us to get caught up in our own little world where we're focused only on ourselves. I've got my plans. Don't get me off my schedule. No, instead, learn to take time for people. Don't miss an opportunity to do good. Make a difference in somebody's life. It doesn't have to be something big. Often, small gestures of love and kindness can make a big difference. A women's group at our church makes blankets, and then the women embroider scripture verses on them, and they take them to cancer patients at MD Anderson Cancer Center here in Houston. Those handmade blankets remind the men and women struggling with cancer that somebody cares. The expression of love gives them an extra ray of hope. Those ladies are using their talents to do something good for somebody else. There are two kinds of people in this world, givers and takers. Be a giver, not a taker. Make a difference in somebody else's life. You are never more like God than when you give. Part 4. Form Better Habits Chapter 16. Feed Your Good Habits An old Cherokee tale tells of a grandfather teaching life principles to his grandson. 
The wise old Cherokees said, Son, on the inside of every person a battle is raging between two wolves. One wolf is evil. It's angry, jealous, unforgiving, proud, and lazy. The other wolf is good. It's filled with love, kindness, humility, and self-control. These two wolves are constantly fighting, the grandfather said. The little boy thought about it and said, Grandfather, which wolf is going to win? The grandfather smiled and said, Whichever one you feed. Feeding unforgiveness, impatience, low self-esteem, or other negative traits will only make them stronger. For instance, you may complain frequently about your job. You're always talking negatively about your boss and how that company doesn't treat you right. Ironically, when we complain, we feel a source of release. It feels good to feed those negative thoughts, but the wolf we feed will always want more. The next time you're tempted to complain, ask yourself, do I really want to keep feeding this negative habit? Do I really want to stay where I am, or do I want to starve this complaining spirit and step up higher? If you will start feeding peace, patience, gentleness, self-control, you will see those character traits begin to develop in your life. Make the better choice, and instead of complaining about going to work, learn to say, Father, I want to thank you that at least I have a job. These people may not be treating me right, but I'm not working for man, I'm working unto you. When you do that, you're feeding the right thing, and the new habit begins to develop. And a habit is an acquired, learned behavior that we do without even thinking about it. It's almost involuntary. We've done it so long, it becomes practically second nature. If we have good habits, that may be fine. But sometimes our habits are keeping us from God's best, and we may not even realize it. Many of the habits we've developed stem from the culture we were raised in. If you grew up in a home where people were disorganized, sloppy, or always late, you may have formed some of those same negative habits. Or if you were raised around people who tend to be harsh, sarcastic, rude, you may have picked up some of that same behavior. You may not even realize that those attitudes and behaviors are offensive since that's all you've ever known. On the other end of the spectrum, other people grow up with positive habits, such as neatness, godliness, cleanliness, and order. Many people have established positive habits concerning diet and exercise. Other individuals have a habit of getting up at a particular time and going to bed at a particular time. That will allow their body to rest and be refreshed. These are all positive, learned behavior patterns. Your habits, whether good or bad, will greatly determine your future. One study says that 90% of our everyday behavior is based on our habits. Let that sink in for a moment. From the time we get up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night, 90% of what we do is habitual behavior. That means how we treat people, how we spend our money, what we watch, what we listen to, 90% of the time we're on autopilot. We do it the way we've always done it. It's no wonder that if you want to change your life, You must start by consciously changing your everyday habits. You can't keep doing the same things you've been doing and expect to get different results. To become a better you, take inventory of your habits. Do you have a tendency to be negative in your thoughts and conversations? Are you always late to work? Do you worry a lot? Do you overeat? Do you give in to addictions? The good news is you can change. You can develop better habits. Most studies tell us a habit can be broken in six weeks. Some studies say you can break a habit in as little as 21 days. And think about it. If you will discipline yourself for a month or so and be willing to suffer through the pain of change, you can rid yourself of a negative behavior, form a new healthy habit, and rise to a new level of personal freedom. If you have a habit of not getting to work on time, change that behavior. People who get ahead in life are usually punctual. Why don't you get up 15 minutes earlier? Plan your travel so you can arrive with time to spare. 
Establish a new routine of being on time. And don't allow yourself to be late when punctuality is such an easy habit to develop. Or if you have a habit of eating a bunch of junk food and drinking several sodas every day, commit yourself to forming better eating habits. Don't go on a crash diet. Just change one small thing at a time. Before long, you'll notice a difference in your energy level as well as your personal appearance. How do we change a habit? It's easy. Quit feeding the bad habit. You have to starve your bad habits and start nourishing your good habits. I heard somebody say, bad habits are easy to develop, but difficult to live with. In other words, it's easy to pop off and be rude, saying whatever you feel, making cutting, sarcastic remarks. That's easy, but it's difficult to live in a home filled with strife and tension. It's easy to spend money that we don't have, charge everything on our credit cards, but it's hard to live with the pressure of not being able to pay our bills. It's easy to give in to temptation and do whatever we feel, but it's difficult to live in bondage, feeling guilty and condemned. On the other hand, good habits are difficult to develop. A good habit results from a desire to work and sacrifice, and sometimes a willing to endure pain and suffering. But good habits are easy to live with. For instance, it's hard at first to hold your tongue and overlook an offense when someone criticizes or insults you. It's hard at first to forgive, but it sure is easy to live in a home filled with peace and harmony. If you will be willing to be uncomfortable for a little while so you can press past the initial pain of change, in the long run, your life will be much better. Pain doesn't last forever. In fact, once you develop the new habit, the pain often disappears. Friends, don't stay stuck in a bad habit. Make a decision that you're going to develop better habits. And to change, you must be consistent. You have to do it day in and day out. You need to form a no-exceptions policy. That means no matter how you feel, no matter how much you want to go back to your old ways, you're going to stick with your new plan, no exceptions. That means you must be willing to press past the pain and discomfort at the beginning of your new regimen. After all, if you've trained your body in a certain way year after year, you've developed behavior patterns to which you've grown accustomed, don't be surprised if your body doesn't like when you try to establish these new patterns. But if you will discipline yourself and stand your ground in a few months, you can form new habits and your life will be much more rewarding. Understand, once you get past that initial pain, Establishing the new and better pattern will be much easier. Think of a rocket being launched into space. Liftoff takes an enormous amount of thrust. The majority of the energy expanded in that launch is spent as the spacecraft breaks free of the Earth's gravitational pull. Once it pushes into outer space, it's much easier to keep moving forward. In the same way, when it comes to breaking bad habits, if you can just get past the first few weeks, it'll get easier and easier, and one day you'll be home free. Think about all the people you know that are trying to lose weight. The diet business is a multi-billion dollar industry nowadays. And although diets can be helpful at times, the long-term solution to keeping your weight under control is not to run from one diet to another. Most of the success achieved by those kinds of diets is only temporary. Unfortunately, most dieters end up regaining that weight and sometimes even more. The better way to get your weight under control and to maintain it is to establish new habits. Start exercising, start watching what you eat, when you eat, and how much you eat. And granted, it's not always easy, especially at first. You'll have to be extremely disciplined. And every time you resist a temptation, every time you make a better choice, it will get easier. And one day you'll notice that you're living healthier and more productive. Remember, in forming new habits, it will always be the most difficult at the beginning. You'll be tempted to turn around or return to your old routine, but don't give in. 
You will always have plenty of excuses why you shouldn't change. You can always find a reason to give up and just keep living the same way you've always been living. Don't be surprised when you're tested. Simply remember, the Scripture says there's no temptation that will come that you cannot overcome. God always has a way of escape. And so no matter how intense the pressure or how difficult it seems, you need to know you can withstand it. God will help you. He'll make a way of escape, but you've got to be willing to take it.